Good evening and welcome to Midweek Bible Class. I'm glad you're here. I want you to know that it is biblically proper for me to preach on till dawn. Now, I wasn't planning on preaching tonight. I was just going to be doing some teaching. But in the section that we're looking at tonight, it is that is biblically acceptable. Uh, we need to light some candles, which is good because we were just talking about the things that don't work here in the building. So that'll help. And, and we're going to be going till dawn. Well, I, Wendy will probably shut it off after an hour or so. We'll go as long as we can. Let's pray and then we will look. Thank you, Lord, for what you have given to us tonight. Lord, how we want to hear from you, how we want to know you, and how we want to cling to you. We pray that you would speak tonight, that you would guard every word I say, and every word we hear, and everything in our hearts, because we want to be yours. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We are in Acts 19. We're going to finish Acts 19 tonight. And Lord willing, we'll even get uh, a good a good bit into Acts 20. Uh, I'm going to read for you a section out of Acts 19, starting in verse 21. Acts 19 and verse 21. And I'm going to read through until the end of the chapter. It's just one story. And then uh, once we have reached the end of that chapter, we'll go back and take a look at what we can see in it. Acts 19, starting in verse 21. After these events, Paul resolved by the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Acacia and to go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he said, it's necessary for me to see Rome as well. After sending to Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. A person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, Men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin, the very one all of Asia and the world worship. But when they heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians were Paul's traveling companions. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. Some were shouting one thing and some another, because the assembly was in confusion and most of them didn't know why they'd come together. Some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front. Motioning with his hand, Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! When the city clerk had calmed the crowd down, he said, People of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of, of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell from heaven? Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. For you've brought these men here who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a case against anyone, the courts are in session and there are proconsuls, let them bring the charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it must be decided in a legal assembly. In fact, we run a risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today, since there is no justification that we can give as a reason for this disturbance. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. What an interesting little vignette in the middle of the book of Acts. And it's all based on one very, very, very human concept. And the concept is pride. Pride is something that we human people cling to and have since the very beginning. Pride really is, well, it's the reason that we're in the position that we're in today. And by pride, I don't mean feeling good because I completed a difficult task or um, being capable in a particular area and knowing that I'm, I'm capable and that I can help in that area. 
Pride is the act of saying that really, when it comes down to it, it really is all about me. That's what pride is. You know, when our kids are little, when they're toddlers, and they're just starting to kind of figure the world out, we tell them, I know you do, I know I told my kids, and I know I heard it as a kid, we tell them time and time again, the world does not revolve around you. And by the time they're 14, that's the thing we say to them more than anything else. The world does not revolve around you. There's a lot of other things going on, and there's a lot of other important people, and you're not number one. However, now, it seems, in a new and unusual way, our culture actually has kind of turned that around and said, you know what the world, as a matter of fact, is all about you. Each one of you individually, that's what the world is all about. And I find it so interesting, as we are now in the month of June, that the symbol of our pride now, our individualism, our great individualism that says the world is all about me and nothing else and I can do anything I want to anyone with anyone at any time at any cost and it doesn't matter the symbol of our pride is supposed to be the symbol of our great humility you guys remember what happened in the bible back in genesis chapter 6 there's a long time lapse between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 5. We don't know how long, but it was a lot of years. God made man. Genesis chapter 3, the man and the woman kind of decided that the world was all about them. And as a result, they lost out on the world that was supposed to be all about God. And they ended up in a world that, well, was kind of of their own making. And it was a real mess, and they were very unhappy with it. To the point that in Genesis chapter 5, they have a record of crying out to God for something different. Well, in Genesis chapter 6, we're told that God comes and takes a look at the world and has pretty much had enough. He says, my spirit will no longer remain with man because he is. And the word there is a word that means corrupted flesh or um, mortal flesh. I'm not going to put up with him anymore. I'm not going to put up with, with the human, humanity of pride, might be a way to put it. It specifically says in Genesis, Now the earth was corrupt, that's a different word for corrupt, in God's sight, and the earth was full of wickedness. That word corrupt is the word decay. The earth was full of decay, like rot. And it was full of wickedness. That is the Hebrew word hamas. It means violence. The world was full of violence and wickedness and decay. And we're told that the, the wickedness of man was widespread on the earth to the point that, quote, every inclination of the human mind was only evil all the time. It was really bad. Humanity had gotten to the point in its pride where each individual said, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it, with whom or to whom I want to do it, and there's nothing you can say about it. You have no authority over to me. I am the individual in charge of me. And it made a real mess of things. Oh, you can read about it. It was just, uh, the world was just loaded with every kind of, of evil and, and every kind of sexual diversion and every kind of, of violence and wickedness and murder that you could possibly imagine in many that we could probably never think up. The world was loaded with this stuff. I watched a, uh, a TV show that my daughter Addie has been binge watching lately about a zoo, about the Columbus Zoo. It's really actually a really good show, highly recommended. It's really fun to watch. In the, the Columbus Zoo, there was this particular snake that developed a couple of bulges in its body over the course of a couple of weeks, and they determined that these must be tumors and this isn't good, and so they brought in a vet who came and did a biopsy, and he said not only is it a cancerous tumor, but it's rotting inside of the snake. And if we let it go, it's going to poison the snake, and it's going to be a, a long and painful death for the snake. I mean, death is what's coming. There's no getting around it. It's going to be a long and painful death. Now, I don't really understand this particular part of the show, but the lady who was the snake keeper, this was her favorite snake. I didn't know you could do that. But she was, she was emotionally attached to this particular snake. 
And she said, I don't want the thing to have a long and painful death. And the vet said, we're going to have to euthanize. It's the only choice. We're going to have to just put it to sleep. That's the most humane thing we can do, because if we let it go, it's going to be horrible. That's what God did to man back in Genesis chapter 6. He said, they have so ruined the earth, it's so loaded with decay and rot, that if I let it go for a few more generations, it's going to be horrible. So I'm going to wipe it away. You know the story, all except for one man and his family, a man named Noah who was righteous. And the reason he was righteous was not because he was a goody two-shoes, it's because he listened to God and did what God said. He believed God, just like Abraham. It was credited to him as righteousness. He believed God and he said, yes, I'll, I'll do whatever you need. He was big on the concept of self-denial. Jesus says, deny yourself. He said, I am not the one in charge here. God is the one in charge here. He wants me to build a big wooden box. I'll build a big wooden box. So he built a big wooden box and called it the ark and loaded lots of animals in it and his whole family. And you know the story. The rains came 40 days and 40 nights and flooded the earth and, and killed every living thing on it except for those whom God had protected in the big wooden box we call the ark. And, and, then, and then it took 150 days for the rain to, to settle, for the water to settle, and, and for dry land to appear. And the big box stopped moving, and, and Noah opened it up. And God, well, actually God opened it up. And Noah came out onto the land, and there was sunshine and blue skies. And it was a beautiful day. And God said, I'm giving it all back to you. Just be sure to serve me. And Noah said, okay. And then the clouds came. And Noah got scared. Because the last time he saw clouds, God flooded the earth and killed everything on it. And Noah said, wait, wait, wait a minute. I don't even have a box anymore, God. What's with these clouds? And God said, listen, here's my promise to you. It's going to rain on the earth, but I'm not going to flood the earth like that. I understand why you're scared, Noah. It's because you're filled with personal pride still. It's because you look at your son's. Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and you see that sickness of pride in them. You see that rot in them. And so you know that I have every right to come and flood the earth once again. And I know that when you see the clouds, it humbles you and you are afraid of them. But here's the deal. I'm going to put my rainbow in the clouds so that when it rains and you are afraid of me and you are humbled in your pride, you'll remember that I'm watching out for you and taking care of you. I find it so interesting that the symbol that's supposed to indicate that God is good, God is watching out for people who need to be humbled and who need to develop a healthy fear of him, has become in our world today the symbol of me. I am prideful. I can do whatever I want. I just find it so interesting. And yet, it's so different than what God has called us to. Jesus has said, if anyone wants to come after me, if anyone wants to be a follower of me, a disciple, someone who lives a kind of life like the one that I'm laying down to live, Jesus said, a kind of life that is full and rich and complete and lacking nothing. Not a heartbroken, struggling to get through the world, hoping to make two ends meet life but a life that is full and rich and real, regardless of circumstances. That life is available to you, he said. And it's, it's not hard. It's not like, he, like when he was talking to Moses back in Deuteronomy. It's not like you've got to send somebody up to heaven to find it or go down in the depths to find it. No, it's right in front of you, that life. He said, all you've got to do, it's really simple, is this. Deny yourself. Humble yourself and set aside the pride. Deny yourself. Deny yourself to the point of taking up your cross. In other words, being fully willing that you should die. And that's that pride inside of you should die. And then once that pride is set aside, he says, just do like I do. John Calvin talks a lot about self-denial. Bet you never thought I'd talk about John Calvin and the Church of the Nazarene. John Calvin says, the denial of ourselves will leave no room for pride, haughtiness, vainglory, nor for avarice, licentious, love of luxury, wantonness, or any sin born from self-love. There's no room for it, he says. 
Without the principle of self-denial, we are either led to indulgence in the grossest vices without the least shame, or if there is any appearance of virtue in us, it is spoiled by an evil passion for glory. That's pretty good from John Calvin. There's no room for that stuff, he said. And even those who are acting like they're virtuous are only doing it to satisfy the self, he tells us. I know that's a really exciting way to start looking at this section of Ephesians. But as I was reading through this section, I just realized that nothing is new. Like the writer of Ecclesiastes says over and over again, there's nothing new under the sun. The way that people did behave is the way that they behave now. We look at the world and say, oh, it's fallen apart. I got news for you. It's already fallen apart. And we're just finally noticing. There's nothing new. I'm struck by Demetrius and his group and the pride that caused them to do what they did. I'm struck by the fact that they really had no religious leanings, these guys. But they made their business in this way. And, and that they were concerned about their business, their livelihood, their lifestyle. And they used religion to get what they wanted to get. And I'm struck by the fact that even though we've seen so many people in Ephesus be set free from so many horrible things, and so had these guys, seen so many people with joy on their faces, who were once terrorized. They say, we can't have this here. Because it's hurting my paycheck. And, and really, Demetrius and all of his guys would say, when it comes right down to it, it's all about me anyway. It's not about them. I don't care about them. I don't care what happens to them. I only care about what happens to me. Let's take a look at the story. It starts with this little vignette that's going to come back later, this little couple of verses. After these events, Paul resolved by the Spirit to go through Macedonia and Acacia and go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he said, it's necessary for me to see Rome as well. It's really important, that little section. Take that little section, put it in the back of your hat. The entire rest of the book is about that statement that he makes. Paul is convinced by the Holy Spirit of God that he needs to travel to Jerusalem and then to Rome. He is convinced by the Holy Spirit of God that he's going to die doing it. But he believes this is what God has told him to do. And it's not all about Paul. It's all about the gospel. It's all about Christ and what Christ wants. And if the Holy Spirit says, I need you to do this, but I need you to know it's going to hurt really bad. You're going to end up in chains and you're going to die. But I need you to do this. Paul said, well, I died a long time ago. I set that pride aside a long time ago, so I'll do it. So he's convinced that this is what he needs to do. After sending to Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. He sent Timothy and Erastus ahead, likely with letters, maybe some of the ones we have here, on into Asia to uh, greet the churches, to see what the needs were, to get ready for a visit from Paul so that he wouldn't have a really long visit cutting through there. He could come through, deal with the issues as he came, and move on. Well, this is toward the end of his time in Ephesus. Verse 23, about that time there was a major disturbance about the way. Pause for just a second. What Luke calls the way is what we would call the Christian church. They didn't call it Christianity then. Matter of fact, to be a Christian was actually a derogatory term uh, at this time uh, because you're following one who was crucified. Uh, we think that's kind of cool. It was kind of funny because it was developed as a derogatory term clear back in the days of Antioch. They were first called Christians at Antioch, which we read about many chapters ago. Um, and the Christian said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we are following someone who's crucified. And the name stuck. Before the religion became known as Christianity. It was known as the way out of John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. If you want to get to the Father, you need to go the way. And so that's what they called it, and Luke is referring it to that. You'll see him refer to our faith as the way. I think that's really cool, personally. I, I think that's, that's as cool as being called a Christian. But uh, he says there was a great disturbance in, we might say, in the church. And here was the disturbance. 
a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. There was a big craftsman's guild there in, uh, in Ephesus that they all kind of worked together and kind of like a union that they all worked together on. Remember I said people would come from all around the world to Ephesus. They would worship there at the temple of Artemis and then they'd stop by the gift shop on the way out and pick up their own little uh, Artemis idol to take home with them. And these guys were making silver copies that were much more beautiful than the, um, the, the meteorite that they were worshiping. These things actually looked kind of cool. And these guys made those things and they made a lot of money doing that. And they were apparently uh, very good craftsmen. Well, Demetrius called together uh, all of uh, his guild, as well as the workers that worked for them in the guild in that type of business, and said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has misled, a cons persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that God made by hands are not God's. You know, this guy knows that. He's making them. I want you to hear the shift in his argument. He starts with, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. And then he gets to thinking, that's, that's not the right way to sell this thing. That's not going to tug at people's heartstrings. You know, I was talking to a good friend of mine. We, we were talking just before we all got started here about the money that we need to raise to fix this building. That we who are members of this church, uh, this is our building and it needs some maintenance and we need to raise the money to do it just like we would do if it happened at our own home. And he was telling me these things. He was saying, remind the people that the building and the property belongs to them. Remind the people that just like their own home, they're, they're going to have to spend money on it. Remind the people that they all need to be involved. And I said, okay. He said, but you have to do more than that, he said. You got you to sell them on the vision, he said. You got to remind them about why this building is here and the things that we're doing with this building and the things that we want to do in the future. I said, well, we talk about those things all the time. He said, keep those things in front of them because he said, people don't give to needs. People give to vision. And he's right. People don't give to needs. They give to vision. Uh, that's why Crystal was saying we should really shut these doors to make it as hot as we can in here so that when you all come in, you'll be like, why doesn't the air conditioning work? Well, we have a vision for being comfortable during Bible study, so people give to that. We have uh, uh, Pregnancy Choices, uh, which is now Care Medical Center, is using part of the building for the next month as their new building gets finished up, and that's a cause we really believe in. These are, are people who are doing a great thing for, for ladies at their biggest point of need, and, and, and we want to we wanna be able to continue doing that. We've talked about the a uh, little laundromat that we want to put in for uh, for those ladies and for the people at college and, and many of the other things that we're doing with the building and how we want to have this asset to hand off to the next generation and all of these other things that we're doing. And, and my friend told me, remind the people of the vision because people don't open their wallets until their heart is tugged on. I'm not really good at that. I'm just going to tell you straightforward, guys. This is this is what we need to do, and, and we just got to do it. And I've always kind of been that way. I, I wasn't one to go make a, make a good friend and then try to sell him. If I needed to sell him something, we're just going to talk about business first. Well, Demetrius apparently is much the same way, and he starts talking about business first. And he says, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. And then he realizes that's, that's getting a couple of them riled up but not all of them. Then he says, you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but almost all of Asia, this man has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. Okay, now they've, now let's talk about this personal insult. He says, Paul has personally insulted us. Now he's got a few more riled up, but he still doesn't have, he still doesn't have uh, the whole group. So he keeps going. And he says, not only do we want to risk that our business might be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis might be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin, the very one all of Asia and the world would worship. Well, that got him. I don't, think, I don't think Demetrius believes a bit of it. I don't think Demetrius cares at all about religion or about this faith or about the worship of this false god. I don't think it matters to him one bit. I came across this quote in a really old commentary. It says that Paul had, quote, touched the most sensitive part of the anatomy of a worldling. I love that. 
He touched the most sensitive part of the anatomy of a worldling, his wallet. Paul had touched that. He was fine with Paul discrediting Artemis. He was even fine with Paul discrediting their business as long as he still made plenty of money. But clearly his big concern is that his income is going to go down. I have a couple of thoughts on that. I have a few, actually. One of them is, you know, just a half a chapter ago, a whole bunch of people got together and burned $12.5 million worth of stuff for their businesses because they realized they needed to leave the old life behind if they were going to follow Christ. We had some people who were really serious about giving up the old life to the point that they had to change profession to give up the old life. Contrasted against Demetrius, who saw these people get set free and said, I'm not doing it. I see what those people had to do, and I am completely unwilling. It's about me, it's about my business, it's about my paycheck, and I'm not giving it up. That's one thought that I have about this. And another thought I have is that it really kind of makes sense. Actually, if you really think about it, it really kind of makes sense. Do you remember uh, back over in Luke chapter 16, there's a parable that Jesus tells, might be a parable, uh, called the rich man and Lazarus. It's not Lazarus from John 11. It's a different Lazarus. A Lazarus who was a beggar, remember, who had sores all over him. And he sat at the gate of a beautiful house of a rich man. And every day the rich man would... If Lazarus was lucky, throw him a scrap of bread. And that's about it. And the rich man lived in wealth and luxury his whole life. But Lazarus loved Father God, clung to Father God. And when he died, Lazarus was in comfort. Everything that had happened to him was gone. He was now spending the rest of eternity in the lap of luxury. Well, the rich man died at the same time. He wasn't so comfortable. He was in a place of judgment and torment. And he called out to God. And he said, what's the deal here? And God said, well, it's really simple. This is the Troy revised and expanded version, by the way. God said, it's really simple. Lazarus trusted in me, rested in me. You, though, you trusted and rested in all your stuff. And he said, and you were perfectly comfortable with all your stuff, weren't you? Trusting and resting in your stuff worked out really good for you for a long time. You had all your good things in your life. He said you trusted and rested in that. But now your life's over, so now you don't have that stuff anymore. It's all burned up. And oh, by the way, you're burning up too. But Lazarus, who trusted and rested in me, now he didn't have good stuff in his life. Oh, I'm sure God could have given him good stuff. I mean, look at Solomon. Look at the end of the book of Job. I'm sure God could have given him good stuff. But for some reason, God didn't. But now, since he trusted and rested in me, he's getting all the good stuff. And since he trusted in me for eternity, he gets it for all eternity. You just trusted and rested in me for life. So I guess it's good, in the Troy Revised and Expanded Version, God says to the rich man, I guess it's good that you lived it up and had a good time, because that's all you get, is the memory of how you were once comfortable. Well, I'm thinking about Demetrius here. This is all he's got, and he knows it. He knows Artemis is a false god. He knows none of that stuff's ever going to work. He knows it. So he better live it up if he's not willing to deny himself and set it aside and come find the way into eternal happiness. Then he better get everything he can out of life. And now Paul's getting in the way. And Paul's costing him the only good he's ever going to have. Now, a lot of things could have costed him that. He could have gotten really sick. There could have been an economic downturn. There could have been a big earthquake, which does eventually happen and takes down the temple. I mean, a lot of those other things could have happened to Demetrius. I mean, his foundation is, is pretty shaky ground, quite literally. There's a reason the Temple of Artemis is gone today, and it's because it was built on silt. But, you know, at the moment... He's got to lash out against anything that he thinks might be oppressing his ability to satisfy himself. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? The one, the one, now listen, the one final thought that I have about this is that if this sounds familiar, that we lash out against anything that, that halts our pride, I think that we as a church really have to stop and ask ourselves, Am I more like those people in Ephesus that burned the scrolls, or am I more like Demetrius? 
Because there's people who come to church week after week after week after week and everything's good until the pastor starts talking about tithing. Everything's good until the pastor brings up money. And then they're not interested anymore. And I know I'm talking about money a lot this summer and it's because we're fundraising. But it seems to me I talk about money a lot anyway because that's a huge issue for us. I mean, that's really where our pride is kept. It's really where our pride is kept. That's what I've done for me. That's what I have available for me. That's, that's how I'm going to take care of myself. I don't, listen, God, love you, great, catch you in eternity. For now, I'm doing pretty well. I got a good paycheck. I got a nice nest egg. I got a big chunk of real estate, whatever it might be. So, hey, God, thank you for eternity. I'll, I'll see you as soon as I'm dead. For now, I'm going to live it up. I can trust in my bank account. And people say, well, I don't have much of a bank account. Great, all the more reason you should be trusting him now. You don't want to hear it from me, but you probably wouldn't mind hearing it from Billy Graham. He was a pretty good, he was a pretty good teacher. Billy Graham said, every person's checkbook is a theological document. It tells you who and what they worship. I like that. Every person's checkbook is a theological document. This guy by the name of Ken Neville He says, perhaps you're familiar with the statement, show me your calendar and your checkbook and I'll show you what's really important in your life. Today it might say, show me your Google calendar and your credit card statement. But the principle is the same. What's really important in your life. Jesus said it really simply. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah. Well, Demetrius' treasure is tied up in his job. He's the, he's the president of the Artemis Idol Builders Guild. He makes a good living doing it. And that's what it's all about for him. And if it means, this is the one that really gets me, if it means he has to evoke religion, if he has to pull on those, on those religious heartstrings to get people to go, well, then he will. Hmm. Well, verse 28. When they had heard this, They were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. What were they filled with rage about? They were filled with rage because their business was affected. Now hold on just for a second because I think that's totally cool. I think it's totally cool that the movement of the Holy Spirit of God in Ephesus was such a big deal that the economy of the city noticed That is so cool. Now, I think that's cool because we've been talking for, seems like a couple of years, but actually only a couple weeks, about how a church impacts a city and about what happens in that city when the church impacts it. And we've realized that 99% of everything about how a church impacts a city happens inside the church. We talked about that. We talked about how if the church is going to impact the city, it's going to have to become spirit-filled, on-fire believers in Christ with a good understanding of the gospel. We can't be disciples of John the Baptist. Oh, we've got to repent and set aside sins. We can go to heaven. We've got to be disciples of Christ who have been redeemed and are being regenerated. We talked about that. We talked about how, um, in the second part, we talked about how we have to know the Word of God. See, it's a good thing I knew where that was. We talked about how we have to know the Word of God so that it's part of us. We're reading it all the time. We're meditating it all the time. We're allowing it to soak into us and become part of us so that no matter where we go and what we do and who we talk to, we're speaking the words of God. Like Paul at the lecture, uh, at the lecture hall of Tyrannus, where for two years, all he did was told people the words of God and it affected everyone in the province. And then finally, we talked about how we've got to leave the old life behind. We got to burn it down. We can't carry around our pride. It's got to go. And that when we do these things, we will affect our community. And, and, I, and I really mean us and we here. When Mount Vernon Church of the Nazarene gets serious about these things, the city of Mount Vernon is going to notice. I don't know specifically what it's going to look like. I guess it depends on how big God wants to make things. But it could seriously affect the economy. You've heard of the Welsh Revival. You guys have heard of the Welsh Revival? It started in 1901. The guy's name is Evan Roberts. 
Evan Roberts, he was a young Christian guy. His dad was a coal miner there, a Welsh coal miner. He figured he'd be a Welsh coal miner too. But as a teenager, he began feeling that God was telling him he needed to preach. And so he gave up his rather lucrative job as a Welsh coal miner, and he went to work for a church there that wanted to have a Sunday school. And so he was the master of the Sunday school. That was his whole job. And they built this little chapel for him called the Pisgah Chapel. And that's where he was going to have Sunday school. Well, he didn't have a lot to do. So Monday through Saturday, he just prayed. Like four or five hours a day. This guy just got into the chapel there and just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And he really felt like God was telling him that God was going to do something in his community. And he just needed to keep praying. Well, he didn't really invite other people to prayer meeting. They just started coming. And pretty soon... So many people were coming to the prayer meeting, they couldn't fit in the chapel. And they're like, well, Mr. Roberts, won't you say a few words? And all of a sudden, he became a preacher. And he really, he didn't know a whole lot to preach about. He'd been to Bible school. He knew his way around the Bible. He, he went to Bible college, but he really wasn't much of a preacher. He said that uh, in his diary that he really preached more or less the same sermon every night, had four points. Number one, we must confess before God every single sin in our past life that has not yet been confessed. Number two, we must remove anything that is doubtful in our lives. Number three, total surrender. We must say and do all that the Spirit tells us. And number four, we must make a public confession of Christ. That's all he had. That's what his Bible college education paid for. Those four points. And so many people were coming to the meetings... They wouldn't all fit there around that chapel. He started going to other places, taking the meetings with him. He wasn't announcing where he was going to go or what he was going to do because he didn't know. He just showed up at a church. You know how in the Bible, Jesus had told some of the disciples, when you go to this place, don't take anything with you. Don't take a purse. Don't take anything with you. He took that to mean him. And so he would just go. Sometimes he didn't even know where he was going. He'd just show up at the church, knock on the door. Hey, can I have a prayer meeting here tonight? And sure enough, they would. And, and people somehow... People would come out of the woodwork. And the thing of it is, it wasn't even like they did a, like they did an order of service. They would just get together and start praying, and pretty soon somebody would start singing. And pretty soon it was a big worship service, and pretty soon somebody would stand up and confess their sins. And pretty soon somebody else would stand up and say that Christ got a hold of their heart just now. And pretty soon somebody would stand up and say, let me know, tell you what happened to me last week. And if there was time, Evan Robbins would, would tell his four his four little point sermon. And so many people got saved. It, we don't even know. We don't even know. The entire stinking community. To the point that from 1904 to 1906, no one bought alcohol there. Now that's a big deal because the number one issue of life in Wales at that time was alcoholism. Everybody was an alcoholic. Everybody drank. Mom, dad, sister, brother, didn't matter. Everybody drank. But from 1904 to 1906, not a single bottle was sold. And you know, you can listen to his points. He didn't preach against alcoholism. Nobody did. It's just that they found Christ. And they suddenly discovered they didn't need that stuff. They had no interest. And, and it wasn't like there was a big effort to shut down the bars. It was just nobody was going. So the bartender may as well go to the revival service tonight you can go home and read about it don't take my word for it the welsh revival it's absolutely fantastic there's this other cute little story and i have to tell it to you because the town was mount vernon it was mount vernon texas but it was mount vernon 1978 there was a small town there was a bar in town that was doing a land office business they weren't just selling booze if you know what i mean and they were selling it palletized i mean they they were running out of room they were bringing in all of these employees and they were they just they didn't have enough room so the, the owner of this bar was making so much money he was making money hand over fist so he had this big plan to expand the bar more than double the size of the bar there in the community he went down and he filed for permits to make this bar all the bigger and a church group uh, argued against the permits. We shouldn't do this. This is bad for the city. I mean, look what it's doing to the city. We shouldn't do this. Look, look at the, you know, the kind of customers it's bringing in. We shouldn't do this. This is bad for the city. 
Well, he got the permits granted anyway. So the church group just started praying. And they told him, we're just going to pray. We're, just, we're not going to pray against the bar owner, they said. We're going to pray for the bar owner. We're going to pray for the customers. And we're going to pray for the people in this town that they find Jesus. And that's what they did. And they prayed for about six months. Well, during that time, the bar owner spent all this money and built his big building and all that kind of stuff. He got it all done and cut the ribbon, grand opening day. And guess what? Nobody came. To the point that nobody continued to come so that he couldn't even pay the mortgage on his new building. And he ended up losing it. A couple years later, he takes this church group to court. And he charges them with, with defaming his business and with actions detrimental to his business. Takes him to court because they prayed him out of business. They got to court and the judge said, what do you have to say for yourself? And they said, wasn't us. Couldn't have been us. We could never do that. They didn't believe it. I have a quote from the judge. I don't know how I'm going to decide this, but it appears from the paperwork that we have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and an entire church congregation that now does not. Funny story, you can look it up. Mount Vernon, Texas. Anyway, that's just cute and it fits, so I wanted to tell you. That's what happened here. The people of Ephesus got so on fire for Christ that they weren't buying the little idols anymore and it was hurting the guy's business. Can you imagine what might happen in the city of Mount Vernon if we got that on fire for Christ? Or wherever city that you're in, can you imagine if the churches would get together and, and be that excited? How it might affect the city. Well, anyway, when they heard this, the, uh, the guild workers, when they heard what Demetrius had to say, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they all rushed together into the amphitheater, which was about a 30,000-person venue. Uh, they rushed into there, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus. Those were two guys that Paul picked up back in uh, Philippi, I think it was. Uh, pick those two guys up. They were with him. They, they brought them in because they represented Paul to him. Macedonians who were their traveling companions. Now, Paul, verse 30, wanted to go in before the people. I love Paul. This guy's fantastic. I got 30,000 people in one venue and they all want to see me. Gospel time. I got a sermon ready for these guys. Dust off the altars, boys. Here I come. And they're like, no, Paul, no, no, it's going to be bad. They're going to rip you from limb to limb. Nope, I'm ready. Let's go. But uh, cooler heads prevailed, and they wouldn't let Paul go out into the middle of them. Even some of the provi provincial officials of Asia, who were his friends, they knew he was going to do it. They sent word to him pleading not to venture into the amphitheater. They knew he was going to do it. I think two things I think are cool there. One, that Paul is a gospel man. And number two, that he had friends so high up in ranking in the province of Asia that they were watching out for him, they, they, people who had become Christians. Well, some of the people who were there were shouting one thing and some were shouting another because the assembly was in confusion and most of them didn't even know why they came together. Uh, skip down to verse 34. Uh, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I know it sounds like they're crazy, but I've seen this kind of thing. I remember in 1992 when the Detroit Pistons won the NBA championship. I remember that because they were up against the Blazers, which was my team, and they lost. And when the Blazers got home, some people went out to the airport and cheered them on, and it was great. Had a little parade, and that was the end of that. But not in Detroit. In Detroit, people came out of the woodwork. They were all out in the streets. Some of them were having a big parade. Some of them were chanting various things. About half of the crowd was just looting. They didn't even know what they were out there parading for. They thought maybe somebody important had gotten shot or whatever, so they were just looting and stealing TVs and this kind of stuff. And, and, and some of the people were around the uh, uh, stadium where the, where the Pistons played, and they were shouting and chanting and this kind of stuff. Pistons weren't even there. They were in another city. They were getting ready to go home. They were so embarrassed. The city of Detroit was so embarrassed. It was such a mess. It took weeks to clean up. That's what happened here. These people were so upset, they didn't even know about what, but they had that crowd thing going on. Well, in the middle of that, a, a Jew stood up by the name of Alexander. He was one of the leaders there. The other Jews pushed him to the front to explain. Let me tell you why the Jews felt like they needed to say something here. Because the Jews were getting tired of being blamed for everything. 
the Jews were being blamed for pretty much everything that would go wrong throughout the Roman Empire. And, and these Jews in Ephesus wanted to make sure that all of the people knew there knew it wasn't them. It was that Paul guy. And by the way, that Paul guy is not one of us. So Alexander stood up to say, it's not us, it's that guy. But they saw Alexander and realized he was a Jew and decided he was part of the problem and shouted for two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, finally had something that they could agree on. Verse 35, when the city clerk had calmed the crowd down, he said, people of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of Ephesus is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell from heaven? Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. For you have brought these men here who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with them have a case against anyone, the courts are in session and there are proconsuls. It's an interesting little um, tidbit, by the way. This was a, um, was a legate. It was overseen by the Senate. It didn't have its own proconsul. It had judges that traveled in a circle, you know, in a circuit, I should say. And, um, and so courts weren't always in session. And I, I love this little historical detail that Luke pops in, that at that moment there was a proconsul available so they could make charges in the court. It just, just shows you who was there and who was paying attention. Let them bring charges against one another, but if you seek anything further, it must be decided in the legal assembly. In fact, we run a risk of being charged for rioting for what happened today, since there is no justification that we can give as a reason for this disturbance. And after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. He got them to think about someone else besides themselves. He got them to think about their city and about what would happen to their city if they were charged with rioting and about the freedoms they would lose if the Roman government had to send in a group of soldiers to calm the city down. He got them to think about something bigger than just being excited. He got them to think about something bigger than whatever Demetrius was upset about and to set those things aside for just a moment and calm down. And I wonder... I wonder if that's something that we can do in our society. If we can get people to just think for a moment about who you are affecting with your prideful decisions. You can think about, you know, mom and dad and sister and brother and the next generation. I don't know. I, I haven't been real successful at that. When people have come to me, I've had people say things to me like, I know, I know this decision they're making is wrong. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, do you, do you see the natural fallout? Do you see what's going to happen if you choose to go this way? If you choose to go through with this action, do you see where it's going to end? Well, yeah, I, I, it probably. I can see where it's probably going to go. And yet you're going to do it anyway. Well, yeah. Yep. I've got to, got to satisfy myself. That's what it always comes down to. And I'm sure that all of us can think of some sort of situation or behavior or attitude or spot that we were in where that's exactly the decision that we made. Where we could, if we could draw our head out of it for a moment and look at it, we could see that's not going to work out well. But to satisfy ourselves, we go for it anyway. Hmm. Anyway, that is 19. Now, I'd like to tell you that we are done with Ephesus, but we're not. It's going to come up again at the end of chapter 20, which we'll be looking at on Sunday. But let's look at a little bit more of what happens after that as we get into chapter 20. After the uproar was over, Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them, and after saying farewell, decided to go to, departed to go to Macedonia. He determined that, um, that it was over, that uh, he probably better get out of there. And now we have this little travel log. And when he had passed through those areas and offered them many words of encouragement, Macedonia, that's Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, and the other little towns around there that we have seen him go, go to. Possibly even Lystra and Derby, but maybe not. Probably not at this point. When he had passed through those areas and offered them words of encouragement, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. Greece generally means he went to Athens, but we know that he also went to Corinth during this three-month period. 
This was his second visit to Corinth, which he writes about in 2 Corinthians. He writes about this period of time and the fact that he was there. And also, many people believe that it was during this stay in Corinth when he wrote the book of Romans. It's possible that it was when he was in Corinth the first time. But there's, there's a lot of people who think it must have been now, and there's good argument for it, because after this, we don't see Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth anymore. We see them in Rome. So it's possible, it's possible that he wrote that he penned the letter to the Romans during that three-month period while he was in Greece. Uh, the Jews plotted against him when he was about to set sail for Syria, so he decided to go back through Macedonia. That's pretty interesting. Uh, at this time, Paul was trying to get to Jerusalem by the Passover, which he doesn't do. Many Jews were doing that exact thing. Many were sailing from these ports to get back to Jerusalem. So some of these Jews who were really important people had discovered that Paul was in their midst, realized which ship he was going to take, planned to take that ship too, and, you know, help Paul take a deep swim with the fishies. Well, Paul heard about it and just decided to go the exact opposite way. He went back north instead of south. Um, he decided to go back through Macedonia. This would be his third trip back through there. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Phyrus from, from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy and Tychus, and Tromephius from the province of Asia. These seven guys, some of them we see later, some of them we don't. Tromephius stays with him for a while. Gaius we see later. Timothy, of course, we see later. Aristarchus we've seen before. Sopater, actually his name is spelled different ways in here, but we see him later. Secundus we don't see. Secundus is kind of cool. He was second is because he was the second child, not making that up. They would number him that way all the way through eight. Some people. They had their first child, their second child, their third child, and that's what they named him. First kid, second kid, third kid. I'm not making it up. And this kid's name was Secondus because he was the second one. That would make Hayden uh, thirdus. Not really. But anyway, I knew a guy named Octavio one time, though. That means eight. Anyway, um, we're going to see some of those again. Some of them we won't. These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas, but we sailed away for Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread. In five days, we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. There's actually a sermon right there, and I've thought about preaching it. And this is the deal. It took Paul five days to get from Philippi to Troas. Flip back to chapter 16. It took him a few hours to get from Philippi to Troas last time, by the way around, Troas to Philippi. He got on a boat, sailed there. The winds were with him. The winds were at their back. They ripped it up and made it in less than a day. It was fantastic. But here, it takes him five days to make a day's journey. Must have been really rough seas. Must have been incredibly uncomfortable. They were probably on a boat that didn't have overnight accommodations because it was basically a ferry boat that would get him there in a day, and it took five days. And, and here's the thing. So often we determine that if that's the case in our lives, if something that ought to be smooth and easy and quick is hard and long and, and everything seems to be against us, well, then God must be against us. We must be going the wrong way. If the winds are pushing against us, the winds of our lives are pushing against us, we say, well, then we must be not going where God wants us to go. But we'll find out as we read through this that Paul was exactly where God wanted him to be. He was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. He was going right where God wanted him to be. Why did he have a horrible trip to trust? I don't know. I don't know. God's timing? I don't know. He had a horrible trip to Troas. But he was right where God wanted him to be. Oh, last time when it took less than eight hours, they knew they were where he wanted to be because he, Paul had seen this vision, come to Macedonia and help us, and they got on a boat and they went right over there, and, and it was exactly what God wanted to do. But same here. Even though one time it was smooth sailing, beautiful, sunny weather, sea smooth as glass, and the next time the wind was fighting them and there were waves everywhere and big scary clouds. And hmm. But I'm not going to preach that tonight because i got one more thing i got to tell you about. And I, I'm looking forward to telling you about this one. The moral of this next story is don't fall asleep while I preach. On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread starting in verse 7. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to start, about to depart the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. 
There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled, and a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill and sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on talking. When he was overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, and embraced him and said, Don't be alarmed because he's alive. After going upstairs, breaking the bread and eating, Paul talked a long time until dawn. Then he left. They brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. This section is so loaded. On the first day of the week, you know, there are some who will tell you that uh, uh, Sunday is not the right day to worship God. There are some who say Sunday is the only right day to worship God. Well, they're having a church service on the first day of the week. That's pretty cool. But I was actually looking in um, Colossians chapter 2, and it says, Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are shadows of the things that were to come. However, the reality is found in Christ. And then also in Romans 14, it says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak only eats vegetables. Get that? If you're a vegetarian, it must be because your faith is weak. Paul said it, not me. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. That was a joke, by the way. Who are you? I, I don't need any letters. It was a joke. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Take their own, t to their own master, servant, stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. You don't get to decide. Only God gets to decide. There are a lot of people that proof text that one little verse and say, see, Paul held church on Sundays. So that's the only day to do it. Well, I saw uh, a chapter ago where Paul held church every day of the week. So maybe that's what we're supposed to do. Seems like just get together. Seems like is what he's trying to tell us. Sunday has been the preferred day of the church since the beginning. It's definitely our preferred day, although we have a Saturday night service here too. Well, Paul spoke to them since he was going to depart the next day, and he kept on talking till midnight. That's something that we're going to talk about a little bit on Sunday. You know, imagine, if you will, if you knew that this was your last chance to talk to somebody, you'd never see him again. What would you say? We're going to talk about that on Sunday. And this is what Paul is doing. He knows that it is his last chance to talk to this church in Troas. He's got a lot to say. And so he kept on talking until about midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where they were assembled. That's interesting for a couple of reasons and not just because it was nighttime. For one thing, because it's a really good little historical note that we see. But for another thing, because in those days, the church was widely misunderstood. And what they did, remember I, I told you they called their communion services love feasts. And they talked a lot about agape, love. And the world thought maybe they were doing some bad stuff up in there. And so, and then they also talked about eating flesh and drinking blood. So they figured maybe somebody was cannibalized in the process. And so to keep everything on the up and up, when the church would meet together, they would open all the windows. Windows in those days either had just shutters on them or they had lattice on them. They would take down all the shutters and all the lattice. And if their service was at nighttime, they would light all the lights they had, every last one of them, so that anybody walking by could see what was happening in there. I like that. I like that a lot. You know, uh, uh, Addie is working with Pregnancy Choices this summer and, and doing some uh, uh, online PR type work with them. And she was telling me just today that um, somebody had written in something about how horrible these people were and these horrible things that they did inside of their building and all that kind of stuff. And obviously the person has no idea. And the answer to it is really easy. And I've, and I've seen the people at Pregnancy Choices do this more than one time. Why don't you come on down and check it out? Doors are open. Come on down, check it out. You don't even need an appointment. Just come on down. You know, if somebody's in one of the rooms, we'll have to wait till they're done. But come on down, check it out. You can see what we do here. That's awesome. If anybody ever says, oh, those Christians are weird. Come on down, check it out. Lights are on. Peek in the doors. Well, the lights were on, and they were in a room. And a young man named Eutychus, which means fortunate, by the way, I think it's interesting, was sitting on a windowsill. Now, we know it was a third-story window, so it's like this. There's the main floor, and then there's almost kind of a balcony type affair. It's a second floor, but it's only like half the floor. And then there's a loft up in the third floor. That's how this building would have been. So the main floor, and then all the, uh, you know, it's wide open up the back, but then the second floor comes out quite a ways, and, and that would have been like a sleeping area for the family. And then the third floor is a loft, like an extra area. He's up in the loft. Okay, so they're in the Mediterranean. It's in late spring because we know it's Passover, so it's warm and muggy, and there's 
lamps everywhere, and they're the kind that burn stuff. It would have gotten very hot and very stuffy up there. And Eutychus, he's called a young man. It can mean anything from 13 to 40. The concept that we're trying to pick up here, it appears that he's probably some like early 20s. He probably worked all day. I remember uh, going and preaching in Grand Ronde, Oregon. Great place to be. A lot of dairy farmers there. And when I got there to preach, the pastor told me, listen, if some of the guys fall asleep, don't worry about it. They've been up since four taking care of the the cows. They stop, come to church at 10 o'clock, have church service, have some lunch, and go back to work on the dairy. Well, that's what I'm thinking about Eutychus here. Guy probably worked all day. He, he's, he's been listening to Paul for a long time. <sighs> he doesn't know if he can listen anymore. He's going to go upstairs, try to sit by a window and get a little fresh air. Pretty soon he's just sitting in the window. I mean, there's, there's no lattice. There's no shutters. He's just sitting in the window. And Paul is droning on. Oh, I mean, no, pardon me. Paul is preaching away. Telling these people things they need to hear. You know, if you guys quit listening to me, I'll shut up. Obviously, people were listening to Paul. They were having a long church service. And poor Eutychus sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on talking. I was telling Wendy, that term for Paul kept on talking, Luke actually uses a little medical term there. It's the idea of something uh, irritating for a long time. (laughs) Anyway, Paul kept on talking for a long time. And when he was overcome by sleep, he was fighting it, but he just couldn't keep going anymore. He fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. So it's not like he fell down and fainted or he hit his head and passed out for a moment. Somebody rushed down there, picked the boy up, and he was dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, and embraced him. Notice how Paul didn't go down and blame him. or say, well, it's your fault. You should have stayed awake. Don't fall asleep during the sermon. He bent over and embraced him. And said, don't be alarmed because he's alive. It's just a cool little story, especially if you think about 1 Kings 17, where uh, Elijah has gone and and he's staying with a widow, the widow of Zarephath. And it's during the famine. And she's just got one son. And the one son dies. And the widow comes to him and blames him. And says, you came and look what happened to my boy. And Elijah doesn't take it personally. He doesn't get upset. He prays for the boy, follows the instructions of God. You can read about it there. And the boy lives. God granted him back his life. It wasn't something Elijah did. It was something God did. And then later, Elisha, in 2 Kings chapter 4, he's staying not with a widow, but with a very wealthy woman. And she's done all this for him. And he says, what can I do for you? And she says to him, don't get my hopes up. Don't get my hopes up. But she doesn't have a son. And he prays and she has a son. And then the son dies. When he's a boy, he dies. And she said, I told you not to get my hopes up. And Elisha went and followed the instructions of God and bent over him just like this, prayed for him, and and God granted the life back to this boy. Somehow the same thing happens here for Paul. God grants life back for the boy Eutychus. Don't be alarmed because he's alive. And that seemed like a really good moment to have communion. That seemed like a really good time to thank the Eucharist, the thanksgiving, thanking Christ for giving us new life You can just hear Preacher Paul pulling that into an awesome sermon about what God has done for us in giving us new life. So they broke bread, and after eating, Paul talked more a long time until dawn. He wasn't done, and then he left. And they brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. So should you fall asleep during the sermon on Sunday and you fall down on the floor, I won't blame you. I won't blame you. But I'm not a miracle worker, so good luck. Very cool uh, section of scripture that starts, I think, on a real down note as we look at what pride has done to us, but then as we look at what happened with the church there in Ephesus. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you have given and what you have done. I thank you for you how you have offered us an opportunity to not be in chains to our pride, but instead to be able to live free in you. We thank you, Lord. I pray that you'll lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.